why do we fear having our eye on the light of God and instead focus on the problem and get blinded by all the data that's uncomfortable? So the scripture for today was Acts 28, which is a, as a background, these, these are all stories of Paul's life. And Paul would go around to different um, groups to share his vision, his awakening, and his uh, message. Oftentimes, as he met different um, Jewish groups, synagogues, etc., they felt that he was speaking something that wasn't true to their past practices. So this is one of the statements of what was happening as he had one of these experiences. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and in return I would heal them. But remember, that's not Paul speaking to them. That's Holy Spirit speaking to them. He, he was basically trying to point out in all cultures and all times, people get stuck. Now, while this was to a group of people, I'd like to introduce you to um, the um, Gospel of Thomas again, which are speak, uh, sayings of Jesus. And, and these are directly to his disciples, not to a new group of people or anything like that. But he basically was saying something very similar. It's saying number 42, and his disciples said to him, who are you to say this to us? And Jesus said unto them, from what I say to you, do you not know who I am? But you have become like the Jews. They love the tree and hate the fruit. And they love the fruit and hate the tree. And he was trying to say, you have started to get stuck in what everybody does. And what everybody does is they want one thing and exclude the other. And then they want the other and exclude the first. And in that state, we live in opposition, we live in polarity, and we're constantly being stuck. So what I'm going to focus on tonight is how we get stuck. How when we're dealing with the idea of being overexposed, what we're actually doing is Right now, all of us are finding ourselves in a state of trying to take in a series of life-affecting, overwhelming outer events that we don't have control over. And what happens is we reach a point of becoming overwhelmed. When it happens, we close our hearts and minds. And then we start going into a series of habitual coping patterns, limiting our connection to God. I need to go out for some repair here. Now, I'm joking a bit, but this is what's true and happens. And what people do when they have coping issues that are unhealthy, they'll start binging on smoking, drinking, and drugs. Binging, not just on junk or comfort food, but binging on whatever habit that is uncomfortable for you, maybe not helpful. Uh, zoning out, I've never watched so much Netflix in my entire life. <laughs> it's the last month and a half procrastinating, taking your time. I mean, as we said, how many, how many more boxes? Padre was bringing up how he's gone through his boxes. Have you gone through some boxes in your house? And what we'll do a lot of, taking it out on others. I've already seen that in traffic. I see it with people pointing fingers all the time. And then avoidant behavior, sleeping a lot more, all sorts of things that make us feel really stuck. And what will happen is when you shut down your heart, or live life on the defensive, there's absolutely no way of healing or light or love can, that can get in. And that leads to doubt. As Buddha said, there's nothing more dreadful than the habit of doubt. It separates us from each other, separates us from the environment, separates us from God. It's a poison that disintegrates friendships, breaks up pleasant relations. It's a thorn that irritates and hurts. It's a sword that kills. I think spiritual growth is the only real growth. 
being the authentic self is the only thing you can truly be. And we need some role models to be able to do that. Moses was awesome. A prince who gives it up and decides to lead a whole people of oppressed people through a desert for 40 years. That's a big undertaking. I don't think I can do that. I can barely handle these talks. Buddha, who not only created schools across the continent of Asia, he literally went and taught kings. And that's a pretty dangerous thing. Can you imagine the three of us going and confronting any president, the last five, telling them where they are missing the boat? Where is their true inner faith? eventually in the healing, the false self has to fall away. It's just another individual. Nobody is a president. Nobody is above anybody else. And everybody is naked in front of God. More of my favorite, Jesus, as a child, spoke to the teachers and wasn't creating a problem yet. But as he grew up, he realized some of the things they were saying were a little bit off. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And then there's another one where he entered the synagogue. So he went on their turf. There's a man there with a withered hand. And as the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal them on the Sabbath, which was against the law, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? And they were all silent on the Pharisees. They weren't, gonna, they weren't gonna try and get into a dialogue. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees, of course, went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodian against him and how to destroy him. And when we see a picture like this, we don't understand all the politics involved. We don't understand that he was in the middle of a political movement, but he wasn't getting political. He was stating truth. I want you to understand there's no separation between God and all the events that happen around us. How can we deepen not only our word with God, but our word with God in our life, in our actions, in our voting, in our participation, be a big brother, be a big sister. It doesn't mean go just march for this or that. It means where, where are you drawn to do service? Because that's what all the disciples were asked to do. It wasn't just going out and ministering in the sense of um, preaching or bringing people into the flock. It meant giving without, you know, there was the woman on the, uh, at the well. She didn't just, you know, her whole group didn't suddenly decide to follow Jesus. He reached out and helped somebody. You know, there's a one little... <clears throat> out of Ron's uh, healing path of prayer that I've destroyed through getting all my readings from my guys and everything. It's, it's the most beautiful way to receive information, both through Ron's writings and them speaking. But they were asking me just to read this as kind of a conclusion of how we tie all the social event, our personal need, um, our inner child and intellect, all this stuff. How does this get tied up? How do we actually, again, bring it back to God? Well, this is familiar to you, I'm sure. Come to me with your misery, with your troubles and your needs, with all your longing to be loved. Stand at the door of your heart and knock. Open to me, for I thirst for you. 